Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tony Payan. I'm the director of the Mexico Center here at Rice University's Baker Institute. It is my pleasure to welcome, uh, welcome you to the halls of the Institute to listen to this important conversation with Mexico's Secretary of Finance, Luis Videgaray Caso. This public lecture and conversation is part of the Mexico Center's McLarty Lecture Series. I want to thank Mac McLarty, represented here by Franklin, for his generous support of these events. I also want to thank our organizing partners, the Aso Asociación de Empresarios Mexicanos and the General Consulate of, uh, of Mexico in Houston, with whom we have had a great, fruitful, outstanding relationship from the very beginning of the Mexico Center three years ago. As you know, over the last 30 to 35 years, there has been a remarkable economic consensus in Mexico, even as the country is still trying to find the right political model. Mexico has chosen a path of development based on open trade and investment and on a foundational relationship with North America, although it has also sought an increasingly diversified set of partners in Europe, South America, and Asia. More recently, and in line with that national economic consensus, Mexico's energy reform comes to cap the country's strategy of globalizing and diversifying its economy. In this trajectory, Mexico's Department of Finance has been a driving force it is truly an honor to receive uh, Secretary Luis Videgaray Caso at the Baker Institute. He, perhaps more than anyone else in the administration, other than the president, of course, can explain the country's achievements, areas of opportunities, and major challenges as Mexico seeks to take advantage of open markets and solid investment flows from around the globe. Secretary Videgaray's many accomplishments are detailed in your program, but I would like to highlight a few. Uh, Secretary Videgaray was appointed to Me uh, uh, Mexico Secretary of Finance and Public Credit in 2012. Uh, he was a deputy in the Chamber of Representatives in Mexico in the 61st Congress and has served as president of the Budget and Public uh, Account Commission. Uh, Secretary Videgaray has received numerous awards, including a recognition as Finance Minister of the Year by Euromoney Magazine in 2014, Global and the Americas Finance Minister of the Year by The Banker Magazine, also in 2014, and Latin American Minister of Finance of the Year by America Economia Magazine, also in 2014. Dr. Videgaray received his degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a BA in Economics from the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México. Please help me welcome Secretary Videgaray to the Baker Institute. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you for a uh, very kind introduction, and thank you all for uh, for being here. It's a it's a great privilege uh, f to me to to be here at um, at the Baker Institute uh, at Mexico's uh, for the Mexico Center program. I want to thank uh, uh, I want to thank the uh, uh, McLarty family here, represented by Franklin, um, uh, for um, hosting these uh, the. Uh, the McLarty Lecture Series. It's really an honor to be here, and uh, it's also an opportunity. Let me tell you something. Uh, as, as a Minister of Finance, I, I get to go to New York several times a year. That's part of the job description. To all, uh, we all, Ministers of Finance, go to Wall Street. Uh, I also go a lot uh, to Washington. Um, there's where the IMF and the World Bank are, and of course, um, Treasury. Um, but this is the first time that I come to Houston. and. Uh, I, I, I should say it's been a mistake not coming before. I've had, I've had uh, uh, during the whole day, I've had uh, uh, very, uh, very interesting meetings with a vibrant business community, with a lot of interest in Mexico, not only interest, many people are already in Mexico doing investment and doing uh, uh, and uh, uh, 
strengthening the economic ties uh, of both our, our countries. And uh, uh, certainly, there are many things that we, we, can, we can do together. I've learned a lot today. And I thank many of the people because um, uh, some of the people that were at, at, at the meetings this morning were are also here. Um, I thank you for your patience. It's, uh, you're going to hear uh, some of the things repeated all uh, again. Uh, but it's been it's been a, a fantastic experience, and we should um, we should be here more often. And uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's something that I'm very thankful for the opportunity. What I what we've prepared for this um, uh, for this talk is um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Mexican economy to begin with. And where are we in terms of the challenges we're facing in the world? Second, uh, I'll, I want to talk a little bit about North America, the relationship between Mexico and the US, the economic relationship, and also the relation between Texas and the US, um, which is quite a, a powerful um, relationship. And then I want to uh, end with some comments on the opportunities that lie ahead of us and also the challenges. Let me start with um, the macroeconomic uh, outlook for Mexico. We are going through a challenging um, period of time uh, for emerging markets. Emer um, emerging markets as a whole, as an asset class, we're, we're seeing capital outflows and a lot of pressure. Uh, volatility. Uh, our currencies have uh, depreciated. And uh, this is an outlook that is likely to, con to continue. Let me point to three particular, three particular problems that we're facing at the same time. Lower growth, falling trade volumes, so act economic activity um, is, uh, overall is not helping. And for a country that is very open to trade, like Mexico, that is a, that is a problem. Second, falling commodity prices, and particularly the price of oil, very much as Houston is affected, uh, uh, Mexico is affected as well. And that's a problem for the economy, but it's, a, but it's a significant problem for Mexican public finances. And third, we have the challenge of increasing the interest rates in the US. Uh, we don't know exactly what the pace will be, when would the next uh, rate happen. Uh, rate, uh, rate hike uh, will happen, but it's something that will happen. We know that it will happen. And the market's already anticipating that, and uh, certainly the US dollar has appreciated, and that is putting some pressure uh, on capital outflows. The last time that interest rates went up and oil went down at the same time, that was 1981. And uh, it, it didn't work that well for Mexico back then. Uh, so it's a challenge. How do we face that challenge? What do we do? Well, first of all, we strengthen our fundamentals. Over the past 20 years, Mexico has shown remarkable uh, economic stability. And that's based on prudent fiscal policies, um, strong regulation of the banking sector, and of course, sound monetary policy. And that, that is exactly what we are strengthening. On the fiscal, on the fiscal side, uh, I mean, the. One thing that we did at the beginning of the administration, back in 2013, was to introduce a tax reform. Believe me, as a, if, uh, if as a minister of finance you want your popularity to be severely damaged in a rapid way, increase taxes. And that's what we did. Uh, but it was necessary because tax collection, non-oil non -oil tax collection in Mexico was remarkably low. It was only 8%, 8.4% of GDP. Last year, it went up to 13% of GDP. And um, even though, no matter how, um, how difficult and unpleasant raising taxes is, uh, it's a good thing that we did it on time, uh, uh, before the price of oil collapsed. Because our dependency on oil um, came down from 40% just in 2012 to 19% uh, last year. So we we're less dependent on oil, we we're more resilient, and that was a, good, a very good step. And uh, we we use we, something that we do every year is that we hedge against the, the, the risk of the price of oil. So for this year, um, we hedged through put options in the financial markets, we hedged at the price of $49. Um, the Mexican crude oil mix right now is about $34. So it's a, it was a very good hedge. And we are protected for the rest of the year. But certainly for next year, we will not be able to, to hedge at such a price. 
So we have to prepare to falling government revenue out from oil. And the way we do it is we're reducing expenditure. So we've had a few budget cuts last year, this year, and we're preparing for a further cut next year because we are treating the fall in oil prices as something that is permanent. It's not going to be, we are not planning to be saved by a sudden increase in oil prices. So we got to be, we, the responsible way to, to do, the prudent thing to do is to cut expenditure, and we're doing that accordingly in order to keep our fiscal framework and our fiscal path uh, on, a, on a sustainable trajectory and a credible trajectory. Of course, the central bank, uh, we have a, uh, is, is absolutely independent, and uh, that has created a very good framework. And inflation in Mexico is at historical lows. Uh, of course, we have a very competent central bank, and uh, this is key to sustain purchasing power and, uh, and uh, to, to protect stability to have a central bank that is uh, independent, but still we work in a very coordinated way. So uh, a, a couple of months ago, uh, mid-February, we, when, the, when there was um, substantial speculation uh, on the Mexican currency, we came out together and we announced uh, coordinated policy on the fiscal and monetary side. Um, again, to prevent speculation, uh, to create disruptions in stability. What this has allowed, the stability of, uh, of prices and overall macroeconomic stability, has allowed for the internal market to flourish. And uh, right now, Mexico is growing. At, uh, last year, uh, in our economy overall grew at a rate of 2.5%. But if you look at the economy, excluding oil and other related activities, which is about 95% of the economy. Oil is about, an oil-related oil construction uh, is about 5% of the economy. The other 95% is growing at a sustained rate uh, of over 3% over the past um, uh, six quarters. So, and how is this growth happening with such a slump in global trade and global growth? It's happening from within. It's the internal market that is flourishing. New car sales um, last year increased by 19%, the number of cars sold. Retail sales, um, that uh, in the, the, the month of February, this, that's the latest figure, we just got it today, are increasing over 6%, certainly beating market expectations. The service sector is growing at 4.3%. Uh, Unemployment is returning to the pre-crisis level, pre-financial crisis level of 2008. It's, it stands at 4.1%. And um, employment, formal employment, uh, continues to grow steadily. So this is what we're trying to protect, an economy that even under very adverse circumstances globally is still, still growing. And uh, a way to enhance growth and foster growth is certainly by doing structural reforms. Structural reforms in Mexico have been um, defined as a path to increase productivity in the economy. Uh, it's only through higher productivity that we will achieve better growth and better wages, better real wages, purchasing power, uh, purchasing power for workers. So the, uh, the reforms, which include changes uh, in the financial market, in telecommunications, energy, the labor market, antitrust, um, and education, to, to name just a few, um, are all driven by a common denominator, which is increased productivity. The financial reform is working, credit is flowing faster, and the banks are quite healthy. And also, interest rates uh, from loans, like mortgages, car, car loans, or personal loans, are going down steadily. The telecommunications reform is perhaps one of the most um, uh, uh, interesting examples of how competition can deliver results, and in this case, very quick results. Uh, the, 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 the telecommunications reform entailed changes to the Constitution and the laws to make it easier to compete in the Mexican market. And uh, the, the results are already visible. Mobile phone rates, on average, last year went down 18% and continue to trend down, while investment is 
um, steadily flowing. And by the way, a company based in Texas is leading the charge with new investment in, into Mexico. Let me talk a little bit about the energy reform, because a lot of the, a lot of the uh, conversations that we had today are about energy, rightly so. The change in energy in Mexico is substantial. It's a radical reform. We used to have one of the closest environments for energy. Some people said that only North Korea had a more restrictive regime. That's not good company. <laughs> so the president embarked on a, on a deep transformation by changing the Constitution, amending the Constitution, and totally changing the laws. The laws and then the regulation, stop setting up the regulatory agencies. And now we have a completely different uh, framework to attract private capital. And what is interesting is that uh, we are really seeing results that have an effect on everybody's, uh, everybody's life, particularly uh, Electricity bills are, on average, 16% uh, down for um, industry, and 10% down over the last two years for households. We've seen uh, significant investment coming in. We've done already three rounds of bids in the upstream for oil and gas, and uh, already uh, $6.9 billion of investment are flowing in. And now we're conducting this year uh, the, our first bid for deep water exploration and development, which is certainly a challenge, a challenge that we welcome and that we are conducting. In this process, uh, in this process, we have to acknowledge that we have a lot to learn. Think about it. We haven't done an energy auction in about 70 years. So there's a lot of catch up and a lot of learning. And we've been very fortunate to have the feedback uh, from the industry and from financial markets and from people in academia. So we are learning and we're getting better. Our first action was relatively successful. The third one was a tremendous success. And we will continue that process. And for that purpose, it's critical that we get feedback uh, um, and opinions and criticisms and even complaints from the industry. And today's meetings in Houston were really useful for that purpose, because we, get, we got relevant questions and things that we are addressing. All of this is uh, what is making, is making Mexico a very competitive country. In fact, there's a study, and I think, I don't know if somebody's uh, changing the slides. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you a lot of slides. I just want to show you this one, because this is a very recent study by KPMG that ranks Mexico as the most competitive destination among 10 countries um, for, in, for investment. Clearly, uh, this is relative cost, this is a cost advantage vis-a-vis -vis the US. Um, this is all public information. Um, clearly, Mexico is quite competitive right now because of the cost of energy, because of logistics, because of location, uh, and of course, the exchange rate also Exchange with depreciation is also plays into, into this. Let me talk a little bit about the Mexican, the Mexican economy in North America. The Mexican economy is increasingly open. If you add up exports and imports, back in 1980, the, the exports and imports were only 25% of GDP. That figure is already 60% of GDP. If you look at, if you look at the, uh, the Mexico's integration to the global economy, trade volume as a percentage of GDP continues to increase. And it's interesting that we're exporting now are not commodities. We are not a commodity exporting nation anymore. Back in 1982, oil exports, crude oil exports, were 67% of Mexico's export. You know what that figure is today? Well, you can see it in the, in the chart. It's only 6%. What is the other? What is Mexico exporting today? It's manufacturing goods. 89% of Mexican exports are manufacturing goods. This is a phenomenal transformation that happened in a very short period of time, if you think about it. It's only 30 years. 
and it's, a, it's, a, it's an accelerated transformation that has been achieved by opening the country to the rest of the world. Uh, first, by joining what was then the GATT, now it's called WTO, the World Trade Organization. Then, of course, NAFTA. Then came the, uh, the trade agreement with the European Union. Today, we have uh, trade agreements, free trade agreements, with 46 countries. And that's, that's before TPP. Let me talk a little bit about um, North America. Because today, trade, free trade, is certainly a topic of debate in the United States and in many regions of the world. The lack of growth, um, underperformance, has led to a lot of frustration. And uh, the issue of free trade is now being attacked by populism and protectionism throughout the world. And certainly the US is no exception. Let me, let me share with you some figures about free trade between Mexico um, and the US. First of all, North American, the North American GDP is uh, $20 trillion. That's 26% of the world's GDP. Mexico is the second most important destination for US products. And that is something that it's missing. I don't hear, I, I don't hear that a lot when free trade is discussed in America. The second largest market for American goods is called Mexico. Mexico uh, and the US maintain a highly integrated uh, production chain. 40% of uh, Mexican exports to the United States are originally goods imported from the United States into Mexico. And this figure is substantially higher to what you see for other economies. For instance, U.S. exports, uh, Mexican, I'm sorry, Mexican exports um, have 40% content of U.S. Um, uh, inputs. That figure is only 25% for Canada. Do you know what that figure is for China? That figure is only 4%. It's a completely different type of economic relationship. In fact, Mexico, um, US exports into Mexico are twice as much as the volume of exports or the value of exports into China. US exports to Mexico have grown almost fivefold in 20 years. Mexico and the US uh, have become a very competitive manufacturing platform. And that is something that is important to understand. Where Mexico or the US exports, let's say, a car, or a refrigerator, or a computer, it's really not an American product or a US product. It's a North American good. And it's very competitive against those of the rest of the world. And it's very competitive because the value chains are deeply integrated. Let me, let me now turn to Texas, because if the relationship between Mexico and the US is important, the economic relationship between Mexico and Texas is absolutely essential. Texas is a prime example of the benefits. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. First of all, Mexico is Texas' main export destination. In 2015, Texas exported $95 billion into Mexico. And you know what? Texas runs a surplus with Mexico. So all the talk about running a large deficit, well, that may be a valid conversation somewhere else. But certainly, Texas runs a surplus, which is not small. It's $11 billion of a, of a, of a surplus. It's not bad. Texas exports to Mexico have increased 363% um, over the past 20 years. Texas runs a, deficit, runs, a, um, runs a deficit with China. It's a deficit of $29 billion. Compare that with a surplus of $11 billion with Mexico. In fact, uh, the trade balance between Mexico and Texas uh, it's much better 
than what you compare to with most um, uh, countries. What are, the, what are the things that we trade between Mexico and Texas? That's a, it's an interesting question. How can we have such a large volume of trade? What is it about? Well, it's interesting that we export and import in the same industries. It's electronic equipment, it's computers, it's auto parts and cars, um, it's appliances. It's because it's the same industry, it's the same platform that is becoming integrated throughout North America. Underlying these trade flows, there is a significant presence of Texans, Texan firms or Texan-based companies in Mexico. Companies like AT&T, Dell, Kimberly-Clark, or American Airlines have substantial presence in Mexico. Jobs created in Texas out of trade with Mexico surpass 500,000 jobs. That figure for, the, for, the, for, uh, uh, for America as a whole is six million jobs. Six million jobs in America depend on trade with Mexico. So this is a relationship that is valuable for both sides, that has created a lot of, uh, a lot of value for both sides, and will continue to create value. Of course, there are many challenges that remain in the relationship. But certainly, this is a relationship that is also changing. With the Mexican border, Mexican-US border, every day, every day, a million people, more than a million people cross, and they do it legally. What about legal immigration? Well, net migrate, uh, the, the number of, uh, uh, of, of, of arrests that happen along the border are the lowest since they've been uh, since the 1940s. Net migration, the number of people that come out um, uh, from Mexico into the US, measured against the number of people that go from, come from the US into Mexico. Well, since 2008, that's a negative number. There's more people going from the US into Mexico than the other way around. So uh, migration is not, should be an issue anymore, at least not based on the facts. This is a relationship that uh, today is based on a market economy, a very powerful market economy. And by the way, all this integration that is happening happens not regarding what people in Washington DC or Mexico City think about it. This is not driven by government. This is driven by market forces. This is driven by, by millions of people uh, making economic decisions every day. We've had a good relationship of the past uh, three years with the US government, and we're doing some new things. And we have many opportunities to improve our relationship, to have better trade. Um, one of the key, feature, uh, key things that we should do is invest more in the border. Certainly not building a wall, but we should be investing in technology. We can make the border safer, but also more efficient. If we put in more infrastructure, we build more bridges. And um, we do smart things, like, for instance, we, for the first time, are doing pre-inspection um, at some pilot projects. So for instance, if you go to the Laredo Airport, and uh, you'll see that there are Mexican customs agents alongside US customs agents inspecting cargo. That allows for a reduction of 70% on wait times. We're doing the same in Tijuana. And we're expanding that project uh, into into El Paso, and uh, next year we'll have another three projects of doing that. These are smart things that are based on trust, and that's the core of the message that I want to that I want to convey to you. This is a relationship that has been built over many years. It's a very strong. It's a close relationship that creates a lot of value for both sides of the country. Uh, and it's a relationship that is based on trust. And we as Mexicans have tremendous trust in the United States of America. And, uh, and we respect the process, the political process here, and uh, we look forward 
uh, to our future uh, together. Uh, we're neighbors, and uh, but not, not only neighbors, we're good neighbors and good friends. And we share many challenges, and, uh, and many challenges, many new challenges will arise in the future. But we will be in much better shape if we deal to them, with them together as neighbors. Thank you very much. Much, uh, Secretary. Uh, I, uh, I think you found some cards on your chairs as you came in to write your questions, and then there'll be a couple of our interns, uh, Raul here and uh, Thomas over here. Uh, they'll pick up the cards, and then uh, uh, Erica from the Latin American Initiative, uh, Director of the Latin American Initiative, will concentrate them and uh, aggregate the questions, and then I will receive them. But to begin with, uh, Secretary, um, Pemex um, is a company that has been in the news quite a bit lately. Uh, it needs some healing, especially financial healing. It's been on my schedule quite a bit lately. <laughs> exactly. So how to get Pemex back in, in shape? What's the relationship uh, that Hacienda is going to have to have uh, uh, w with um, uh, Pemex uh, so that Pemex can then become the kind of company that not only um, uh, does business in Mexico and partners with other companies in Mexico, but perhaps expands to invest itself in other countries and becomes truly a global company and not just a company confined to Mexico. Tony, I just told, uh, I, I just told you I go frequently as a Minister of Finance to New York. Last week I was there, but the different, uh, what was different this time around is that I was, I was uh, talking to investors and analysts alongside the CEO of Pemex. And that should provide a clear signal, a powerful signal, of the nature of the relationship between uh, the Ministry of Finance and Pemex. Pemex is a large oil company uh, that is facing many of the struggles and the same challenges that, uh, that um, oil companies are facing throughout the world. And the way that Pemex should respond is uh, like the rest of the industry is responding. And certainly um, um, Houston knows that very, very well. Uh, Pemex, like the rest of the industry, should cost, uh, cut costs become much more efficient, um, do projects only that are profitable. Uh, when when, when, when uh, the barrel of oil was at 100, many projects look good. Now, many of those don't look that good anymore. So uh, Pemex has to focus on what is profitable today. And, uh, and of course, the energy reform provides a fantastic platform for Pemex uh, to, to develop into the future and do the things that you just described. Because now Pemex has the, the ability to partner with the private sector in the upstream, midstream, downstream, and, um, and bringing capital, technology, expertise that was not available before to Pemex. So Pemex has to do all things. And um, our role um, is to support Pemex in two ways. First, to provide liquidity, uh, if it's needed, in order to support the adjustment. And we just did that last week. We announced a substantial uh, support package for Pemex, uh, about $7 billion, which is not, not a small thing. And uh, 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 so that's, and we will, we will be there. We, uh, uh, the Mexican government cannot afford Pemex to fail. And we will always be behind Pemex. But that's just half of the story. And perhaps it's not important, the most important one. The most important one is to make sure that Pemex is changing. And that, that, that Pemex is seizing the opportunities and doing the adjustments that it has to do in order to seize those opportunities. So as long as we continue to see Pemex uh, making steps in the right direction, of course, we are willing to provide support. We wouldn't do it the other way around. Uh, if we didn't see an adjustment happening in Pemex, it would, very, it would be very, very tough to put taxpayers' money into, uh, into the company if that company was going to waste. But it's not. And we're seeing, we're seeing the progress and, uh, that we want to see. And we will, we, will, uh, we will remain absolutely supportive of the company. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, su the support is not only money, but it's, but it's also making sure that the changes happen. Uh, another uh, issue that has been in the news quite a bit is obviously uh, the debt, especially the governors and the municipalities' debt 
that adds ultimately to Mexico's uh, credit ratings and its uh, ability to borrow in the markets and, uh, and it has a relationship with its GDP. So it has other structural um, effects on the, uh, in the financial markets for Mexico as such. Uh, what is the future of the relationship among the various uh, go uh, governors, the states, and the federal government, and how is that going to get restructured so as to bring some discipline to the local governments? Well, there was a, a constitutional amendment uh, that went through Congress last year, and this year we just got uh, the enabling law to impose limits on states' debts. So for the first time, we have uh, the power to impose debt ceilings and uh, covenant type of, of uh, structures uh, that would certainly curtail any uh, the problem. But let me give you some perspective. Uh, if you add up all the debt of the states and municipalities, it's not a large number. It's only 3% of GDP. So it's not, it's not something, that, that number is much lower than what you find uh, in Brazil or Argentina, and certainly much lower than what is in the US. That figure in the US is 17%. So the, the states and municipalities' debt is not something that endangers, endangers our stability or our credit ratings as a nation. The problem is in some specific states where we see some very negative trajectories and excesses. So, so we are, um, it's, uh, this is not a problem that is uh, universal that we see in all states, but where we see it, it's quite acute. So therefore, uh, and, and, and the, your question was about the nature of that relationship going forward. It's a, it's a relationship that is changing dramatically because now the federal government has been granted the power to impose limits and to, and to impose controls. Great. I'll, uh, I'll bring in some of the questions from our uh, public. Has the energy reform, uh, was the energy reform the right thing to do at the wrong time? the timing of the energy reform and the conditions of the global market? Well, I think it was the, uh, uh, we were very fortunate to have done the energy reform uh, when we did it, uh, before the price collapse, before we, because without the energy reform, uh, we would be in a very difficult, difficult position. Think about Pemex. Pemex can now uh, have, a, have a good future, and, a, and actually a very good future, because of the energy reform. And, uh, and perhaps the question is about our ability to attract capital into Mexico because of the low oil prices. You know what? We're, get, we're seeing a lot of interest and, and capital is flowing. Um, uh, for instance, at some point I was personally concerned about the deep water auction that we're conducting this year because the price of oil is low. Uh, but we talked extensively to the industry and to the companies, uh, both independent and the major companies. And we came to the conclusion that it's very important that we preserve the certainty of the process, and that the process moves on. And of course, when, when the first bar of oil comes out of those, um, of those fields, that will be eight years, 10 years down the road. So nobody's planning based on the current oil price. And in fact, uh, some of the inputs uh, uh, are lower cost today than what they were two or three years ago. So uh, in a sense, there are even economic reasons why not to stop the, uh, uh, the bid. So we're moving forward. And we're moving forward um, also downstream, midstream, on the power side. Um, last year, we already got commitments for $7 billion in, in just in the upstream. And we expect that to continue. Uh, a couple of months from now, we'll, around, we'll announce the second round. Um, that will happen next year. Uh, it will be uh, shallow waters again. So the process is moving forward. And um, I'm very, very thankful that we were able to get it done uh, before the price of oil collapsed, because that's the reason why that we have a bright future for the industry today. Thank you. Uh, I have another question that uh, also uh, we often talk about, and that is the informal economy. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the ability uh, of uh, the revenue collection for the Mexican government has increased from 8.4% uh, to above 10%. But it's still lagging behind the well, OECD. Thirteen percent. Thirteen percent. So, uh, but it's still lagging. Uh, so, what are the strategies to uh, make sure that Mexico rises to about the average of the OECD, and that uh, the government has the funds it requires to invest in education, infrastructure, and other important 
Well, we did the important tax reform, and uh, some of the results of the tax reform is uh, precisely to uh, reduce informality. Um, last year, we had an increase of 20% in the number of personal, uh, uh, personal income tax returns. So 20% more people did actually present uh, their, their, tax, um, their tax return in April. Uh, this year's numbers look better than last year. Um, we have 12 million more taxpayers registered uh, in, the, in, in the economy. It's, we are 120, people, uh, 120 million people countries, so adding 12, more, uh, 12 million more taxpayers is not a minor, is not a minor thing. And, uh, and a lot of the, 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 tax, the additional tax revenue is coming from, is coming from that, uh, that effort. Um, we made a commitment after the tax reform of 2013, which was not to increase taxes again in the administration. And that's the reason, there's a reason for that, which is to provide tax certainty. Uh, I firmly believe that the thing that can hurt investment more and job creation more is not if the particular tax rate is, is 32 or 30 or 29, is the uncertainty about what the tax rate is gonna be and what the tax regime is gonna be. So we want, uh, we want the private sector to invest and create jobs. We want to provide certainty. We don't want the private sector to be speculating if we're, doing, we're increasing taxes again this year. Of course, we're still, uh, we still have a long way to go. And uh, the, at least now we're in the Latin American average because we were last, uh, only El Salvador had a lower tax burden than us. Now we are the average. Now, but uh, we, still need to, uh, we still need to move forward. But you cannot that, do that every year. Um, so I think it's going to be a, a challenge for the next administration, an opportunity for the next administration um, uh, to, give, uh, to make the next step. I think that the increment has been substantial this time around, but now we're focused on providing certainty. We have a question that has more to do with monetary policy, but perhaps uh, you can uh, certainly expound on that. How much did, does, or will the Fed monetary policy, that is the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve, uh, uh, shock, or what will the effects be on the uh, Mexican currency, and why did Mexico's foreign uh, currency intervention ignore a rules-based approach? I hardly understand that question myself, but it's a monetary policy question, I'm sure you've well, talked about I it. Know, uh, I know who made a question, but it's a very good question, actually. And, um, and first of all, uh, uh, Fed actions um, have a, a, a very important effect on Mexican markets, and particularly the market for a currency. And, and the Mexican peso is now one of the most traded, most liquid currencies in the world. And it's a 24-hour uh, uh, market. Um, sometimes it's a proxy for other emerging currencies. So sometimes what happens if something bad happens in Russia, you short the peso, or something happens in Brazil, you short the peso. So it's a, it's a, it's a very active market. And Fed policy has proven to have, and will continue to have a significant effect. Of course, as, as, as US rates go up, um, you should expect uh, pressure on all emerging market currencies, including the Mexican peso. The reason why we changed from a rule-based uh, uh, use of reserves to a discretionary approach was to be less predictable. And we explicitly said that. We want to be less predictable. In a world that is, uh, the, where markets are ruled by algorithm-based trading and quantum and, and, uh, and quant uh, funds, um, uh, our rule-based intervention was clearly used as an opportunity for arbitrage. And uh, it was dampening uh, the, uh, the effectiveness of both monetary and, and currency policy. So we changed the rule, and uh, we, we've announced to the markets that we'll intervene when we deem necessary. And uh, we want to be a little bit less predictable. And it has worked. Uh, we intervened uh, that same day, February 17. And after that, we have not intervened. And we, what we explain to the market is that we will continue to intervene. We will intervene when we see substantial deviation from fundamentals based on speculation. And um, we want to do that because ultimately we're not protecting the exchange rate per se, but we're protecting inflation expectations. I have another question. What about Canada? What is the percentage share of the NAFTA trade? And if I may add, why has not trade with Canada grown? as much as with the United States? What, what is missing there in the relationship with Canada? Well, I think it's proximity. Um, the, the reason why, if you, if you look at the US exports into Mexico, uh, total exports are 190 uh, last year. Half of those were Texan exports into Mexico. 
It's not, uh, and if you ask what the export Texas exports into Canada are, it's, it's, it's a much lower figure. And that's, 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 the, uh, that's because of proximity. The advantage of being close uh, is, nothing, is, is not uh, an advantage to be underestimated. Uh, but still, uh, trade with Canada has increased, and, uh, and we think that it will continue to, it will continue to increase. Particularly, uh, there there are large opportunities on energy-based uh, um, economic activity and investment, and uh, the fact that both uh, that the three countries, Mexico, the U.S., and Canada, are energy abundant, low cost. Uh, of energy countries um, is part of why we think that North America can be the most competitive region in the world um, in decades going forward. Why is it that the facts um, of the relationship between Mexico and the United States on immigration, on trade, uh, the interdependence that has been built has not caught on in the American political debate and Mexico continues to be uh, a kind of a, a, an easy target uh, in political campaigns? What is going on there? Well, I'm not an expert on, on uh, uh, U.S. public opinion, uh, so it's, it's hard for me to explain why it happened. But I think we should, uh, we should all Mexicans, and it's not only the government, but particularly the private sector, uh, we should be more, more active, not, not, not uh, talking about uh, uh, the actual facts, and the, and the data and uh, things like I've shown you today uh, in my presentation. The, this, is, this is something that we can all do. Uh, does not imply any type of political participation, but it's just, just making the case for a, for a better and closer relationship uh, between neighbors. And, uh, and it's something that we should all, all do. I, I had uh, um, uh, last evening, I had a, a, a dinner with an exceptional group of Mexicans um, that are also Americans. That are these, these are businessmen um, and, and entrepreneurs that are both Mexican and Americans, and uh, now they realize that this is also an opportunity. This environment, this political environment, is also an opportunity to speak more about Mexico and to speak and to speak good things about Mexico and the facts of the economic relationship. So uh, I think that um, in the future we, you'll see a lot more of that. I have a question. Uh, uh, security concerns remain uh, for many investors. Uh, yet budget allocations so over the uh, uh, cross domestic product uh, are comparable to other OECD countries. Will that change? How will the funds be allocated? Where is the security issue there? It's something that we actually get asked quite a bit at the Mexico Center as well. Uh, there's a lot of interest. A lot of people want to go into Mexico, and, and yet they always carry that question with them. Well, let, let me answer that question from the um, uh, finance ministry perspective. Every time that we see a reduction in, um, in violence and better security, we immediately see more economic activity, more investment and more jobs. Um, think of the case of the, the city of Monterrey that went through a difficult, difficult time uh, uh, security-wise five years ago. Things improved dramatically and investment and economic activity uh, did the same. Perhaps the most uh, impressive case is Ciudad Juarez. Uh, Ciudad Juarez alongside El Paso was a, uh, went through a major crisis, and things are much better now. And if you go to Juarez, you will see signs, this is, this is something that you don't see in Mexico City, of uh, companies hiring and willing to pay signing bonus to workers, because it's a full employment and the city continues to attract activity and investment. So it's a, and, and, but this is a story of how security creates prosperity. We see it in the state of Michoacán, they just uh, uh, a couple of years went through a, a significant crisis because of the drug trade, and um, uh, things improved dramatically, and, and you see very prosperous agriculture, uh, avocado, uh, berries, uh, lemons, uh, that, that are flourishing and, and now uh, they are leading the charge of exports, agricultural exports into the rest of the world. That, 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 uh, those are clear signs that when, when um, security improves, the economy improves and jobs are created. And so that's, that's the reason why this continues to be, and, and will be to, uh, uh, till the end of the administration, a high priority for, uh, for our president. And uh, of course, it's a tremendous challenge. It's a very difficult challenge to address, uh, but we've had successes and, uh, from which we can learn, like Ciudad Juarez or Michoacán or, or, or Monterrey, uh, to face new challenges that emerge, uh, uh, that emerge um, uh, almost every day. Uh, in terms of uh, the federal budget, uh, will Mexico go to- By the way, I didn't, I didn't answer. We're not cutting the budget on security. That's, that's very important. Uh, we're not, we're, we, uh, we've done um, three budget cuts in a row, and those cuts are not affecting security. 
not uh, and not uh, or not not for the uh, not for the police, not for the attorney general, and not for the uh, armed forces. In terms of radical bu budgeting reform in Mexico, will Mexico move to zero base budgeting, or will that be continue to be last year's? budget as the base for the following year's budget? Well, we, can, we, we, uh, we changed that methodology already for, for this year's budget, and there was a lot of, uh, in many items, there was a zero budgeting concept, and some programs disappeared, some others were merged, and um, what allows is for a better evaluation of the quality of spending. Of course, it says with any other country, there are entitlements. We cannot cut pension funds. We, we cannot cut um, uh, pension payouts, and, and there are entitlements that cannot be um, adjusted um, uh, in a budget process. But other than that, we're going through that. And for next year, uh, you should expect more of that. We should expect um, a substantial revision of, of the quality of, of expenditure and um, some significant cuts to those programs that are not uh, working as they should. Uh, Mexico is part of the Pacific Alliance, uh, the TTP. Uh, clearly, uh, it is expected to have an impact on NAFTA. In fact, some people have argued that it dilutes NAFTA that it gives uh, uh, access to other partners that will compete with Mexico and so on. What are the expected effects of the passage of that treaty when it comes on NAFTA in the North American special relationship? Well, first of all, Mexico is already a very open economy. And we have uh, already free trade agreements in place uh, with the most important economies uh, in TPP, uh, including Japan. Uh, including uh, the, our South American partners, Chile, Chile and Peru, and of course the U.S. and, and Canada. So, so uh, uh, for us, it means really um, establishing free trade with six other countries, uh, which is important. It gives access to our products to uh, to those countries, and we're we're more than uh, looking forward to compete uh, in those markets. And uh, um, it also, TPP is very important because it's an improvement over NAFTA. Um, particularly labor rules, environment, intellectual protection. Um, the, we are bringing uh, 21st century standards into a treaty that's already 20 years old. So it's not, it's, it, it's not a way to dilute NAFTA, but it's a way to upgrade NAFTA into the 21st century, which is something that uh, investor protection uh, provisions are strong. Um, so it's something that uh, um, we we are looking forward to to being a reality. Um, it might not be uh, that quickly, but um, uh, we are part of TPP and we strongly support TPP. I have another question, Mr. Secretary. Isn't it easier to increase collection of taxes in a more efficient way rather than increase taxes? Well, you have to do both. When your tax collection is as slow as as it as, as it has been in Mexico for the past few years, you have to do both, and we're doing both. There's a couple of questions that are kind of controversial because they refer to both DeWall and Trump. All right. If you, if you, if you want to comment on that. I am more than willing to do that. Great. Uh, how are the renewable energies taken into account in the new energy? Oh, you're not asking Trump? Well, if, if, you, if, if you want to comment uh, more on than, that. Yeah, I'm more than willing to do that. Uh, absolutely. Please All go right. ahead. Well, um, I, I want to make it very clear. Uh, it's, uh, it's, the US, it's the American people who will decide who the next president here is. And it's not for the Mexican government to, uh, uh, to, to um, make an opinion on that. Uh, however, the proposal of Mexican pay, Mexi making Mexico pay for a wall, that is something about Mexico. And I can tell you, we're not paying for, the, for such a wall. <laughs> There's no way. And uh, it's not only because it's, a, it's a quite an absurd proposal, that wouldn't make any sense for either Mexico or the U.S., uh, but also uh, it's a matter of dignity. We won't be bullied into paying for a wall or changing our domestic policies. Talk about renewable energies in the new uh, structure of energy um, in Mexico. Well, the, Mexico has been a strong proponent and um, uh, perhaps the leading emerging country, emerging market country uh, in the in, in the Paris Agreement for, for Climate Change. We have one of the most ambition, uh, ambitious targets of uh, emissions reductions. And in order to achieve that and, and, and fulfill our commitments, we need to aggressively promote uh, clean energy sources. And uh, we have our own laws uh, that uh, give us 
uh, uh, for the next 10 years, we should be steadily increasing our use of uh, uh, cleaner energies. We have set up the incentives, and we have set up uh, uh, the, the consequences of not doing that. Um, and and uh, we just had our first um, auction under the new uh, uh, private sector-based framework that came out of the energy uh, reform for clean energy. It was hugely successful. Uh, it's it's uh, and, and and actually the cost of the, the cost of solar energy is going to be the lowest that you've seen uh, around the world, and uh, it's a it's 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 a very good thing that uh, that there's such a strong market interest uh, in in clean energy because this has to be this has to be a market based. Uh, process. Uh, it's got to be profitable to invest in, in clean energy, and certainly the first experience that we had um, uh, just three weeks ago shows that. There's a question on the peso dollar exchange. Uh, we've seen the peso fluctuate uh, recently from 13 to close to 19 and back down. What do you expect it to be, if you have a crystal ball somewhere, uh, to be in the next I don't. Uh, 12 months? Well, I don't have a crystal ball. And um, we, we firmly believe in, uh, in a flexible exchange rate. And, uh, and to allow the exchange rate uh, to work as a shock absorber, um, certainly as the price of oil fell, our terms of trade deteriorated. So from a macroeconomic response, you would expect a, a currency depreciation. And that is what happened, so we welcome that. Um, of course, uh, uh, the, when, when the, the value of the exchange rate deviates substantially from fundamentals, that is a problem because that can affect inflation expectations. So that's why we intervene. But other than that, other than those, under those very special circumstances, uh, we allow and we welcome exchange rate uh, market adjustment as, as part of our buffers um, to deal with external shocks. Uh, there are several questions on the issue of corruption, obviously something that has to do with Hacienda in as much as Hacienda tracks the financial uh, transactions in the country. Uh, what is uh, Hacienda's strategy to fight all these different uh, funds that flow perhaps from public funds into private hands and uh, organized criminal financing and so on? How do you? Do you have a strategy for uh, uh, corruption in that sense? Well, we, we have uh, substantially increased our capacities, uh, both for tracking funds uh, within the Mexican financial system, and this is something we've, record, we've closed. Uh, we work closely uh, with the U.S. government and uh, several agencies in the in, in the U.S., and also for tracking movements that go outside of Mexico. And we've been part of all the uh, transparency agreements um, uh, led by the OECD. We're the first country to have a FATCA agreement uh, with the US. And uh, uh, it's only when uh, authorities can track financial transactions that happen within the country and between countries that we can uh, effectively prevent this from happening. And um, the amount of information that we have, and it will have, that we will have in the coming years as authorities, both the US, Mexico, and other countries, is going to be uh, of substantially better quality and quantity. And that, 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 that is going to be a fundamental tool to fight um, illegal movements of money, uh, either be um, uh, from, from the drug trade, uh, corruption, any other so, or any other sort of uh, illegal financing. We're uh, coming up to the end, but we have a couple of more minutes. Um, we, um, you have the scissors uh, when it comes to the budget. You know where to cut. Where are those cuts coming? What particular rubrics in the budget are those cuts going to be uh, in the coming fiscal year? Uh, and what will you spare? Well, we already announced that we're doing a budget cut for next year. Um, it's, not, it's not a minor cut. And um, the way we want to do it is through program evaluation. We have a system of, uh, for independent evaluation for the effectiveness of programs. And when that we want that to be the, um, um, if you may, uh, the, uh, the hands that control the scissors. It shouldn't be a discretionary decision of the Ministry of Finance, but it should be uh, based on program, program uh, performance. We will protect some areas, particularly security. We don't want to cut uh, into security. But other than that, um, it's going to be uh, evaluation based. Mr. Secretary, what is your view on the functional currency or moneda funcional to allow accounting in dollars and save millions on hedging? I don't understand the question. Yeah, I don't either. But I think, uh, uh, I guess it's the use of the dollar in Mexico to. Uh, no, I'm not sure. 
Uh, um, whose question is that? Would you explain, please? Sure. Um, maybe uh, let me cover uh, a lot of people have heard this before, but some of what I understand without being a tax expert, just as a general business lawyer, is that some companies are trying to distract uh, resources for infrastructure projects, particularly in the energy sector or in the energy sector, uh, because they have to pay income tax when the project is still not in operation, might be only in construction. So what, what they are saying is that the Mexican income tax law provides examples in other jurisdictions, and there's other countries that do this, like Canada, Chile, and what we're trying to do is avoid because of the volatility of the exchange rate, then there's a capital gains. So, mm. so more or less that's the idea, but happy to discuss with you and you. Oh, it's a tax question. I thought it, were, uh, uh, it, uh, I thought it was a, a currency or monetary policy question. I. I uh, I, I get it. Well, that's that's an issue that we're looking at uh, because it, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, it, you can have some of these tax distortions uh, when even before the project is operational, is 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 creating true profits, just by uh, but, but, and and these are, these are profits that do not show up in a bank account but only in the books because of uh, trade flu uh, currency fluctuations, and uh, yeah, this is something that we're looking at um, and. Uh, 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 you might see some uh, some corrections uh, in the budget for next year in the, in, in the last side. We're working on that. Thank you. Last question. Uh, the discussion focused on public finances and uh, fiscal budgets. But how does Mexico stimulate small business activity and access to credit? Well, one of the things that that, that uh, uh, the, the structural reforms have achieved is that uh, they remove barriers to competition and for um, for emerging companies to grow. And particularly, we are making a more substantial use of our development banks. It's interesting, but before the reform of 2013, um, it was written into the law that the main objective of development banks was to protect their capital. There's an easy way to do that, which is not lending at all. So that was corrected, and now we are seeing healthy, a, a, a healthy growth in the development bank's portfolio, and it's basically geared towards uh, small companies. And uh, we have a special programs for, uh, for agriculture, for housing, uh, but the bulk of the development bank's growth is based on, on, um, on small companies. We, we found uh, also that the financing gap for a small and medium-sized company sometimes is not about debt, but it's about equity. And as opposed to the US where you have a vibrant uh, private equity, venture capital private equity community uh, and industry, we don't have that in Mexico. So uh, part of the efforts that we're doing through development banks is not only to develop lending for small and medium-sized companies, but also for, for uh, expanding equity availability. And now we are supporting an emerging uh, private e equity industry in Mexico, which is, is, is very promising. Still, uh, the lending to small and medium-sized companies uh, last year grew 18%. And this is not only development banks, but also uh, commercial banks. So the reform, uh, the, the financial reform is working in that sense. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Please help me thank the secretary. Thank you very much. <laughs>